How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. And this is going to be a very special show today. We have, uh, we're going to be talking about Johnny Valentine, who was one of the biggest stars in the history of this industry. He passed away at about 3 a.m. today. Uh, he'd been sick for a long, long time. Many people who uh, had been following his, uh, you know, he'd, he'd just been uh, in, in and out of the hospital. There were many times where they thought he didn't have much time left. Uh, he fought it for well over a year. We're going to have Red Bastine, who had visited him many times, who could probably... Uh, they both live in the Dallas area, and uh, Red Bastien was one of Johnny Valentine's big rivals in Texas in the 70s. We're also going to have Ric Flair up, and uh, we can also talk to Ric Flair about his current situation, and also Les Thatcher, who grew up watching Johnny Valentine, uh, and uh, Larry Matisic from St. Louis, who we've had on the show also many times in the past, who announced some of Johnny Valentine's uh, uh, greatest matches in the St. Louis area in the 70s. So uh, this is going to be a memorable show, but... Uh, I would suggest that some of you who are older fans would probably want to get uh, the tape recorders ready for this one because I expect it to be really good. We've got, of course, we've got uh, Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly here, and I also want to make, mention that Dan Severn, who was scheduled to be our guest, uh, we're going to reschedule him uh, just because of the uh, the Johnny Valentine situation. I thought it would be better to devote uh, this show talking about um, him and also for a lot of newer fans to uh, basically learn a little bit about a guy who was uh, not necessarily the most liked man in wrestling, but... Uh, Certainly uh, someone that everyone uh, everyone from the 50s, 60s, and 70s certainly knew about Johnny Valentine's reputation. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. Okay, that's good. Um, I think uh, first thing uh, we're gonna, we should do um, is talk a little bit about uh, last night's television. Brian, uh, what were your thoughts on the show? I didn't think that Raw was uh, actually, it was. I thought it was a decent show, but I think the whole thing with me, again, was it uh, all came down to the main event, and there were a lot of things they could have done in that main event, and what they did was they had Steve Austin give Matt Hardy the stunner, and then Hunter pinned him, and right then I just thought, you know, next week they can do the uh, six-man with Hunter Austin and Ivory versus Hardys and Lita, and Hunter can pin Lita and just make it a straight three. <clears throat> the... Um... I, I don't know. There was something about the show. Obviously, the, the wrestling was really rushed, which I understand was not necessarily by design. Um, it just worked out that way. You know, the, the, they, they spent all this time building up the submissions for, uh, you know, Benoit and Jericho against Regal and Angle, which at, actually was scheduled to be, at one point, the pay-per-view match. So they gave, in, instead of saving the submission match for a, a, a subsequent pay-per-view, they gave it away on TV and did a two-minute match, and it was... Um, I mean, it was just too rushed. I mean, there's no way you, you, you know. And, I mean, they were going they were going in and out of submissions like 20 seconds in. I mean, the idea was to get submissions more over, um, but I I really think that it almost, I don't know. It just, it didn't, it, when, when they get them so easy, I don't think they mean anything. Well, there, there were two things to me. The first one was, it seemed to me like they had a show, and, of course, Vince McMahon has a main event in his mind for the pay-per-view, and it's already been announced and everything like that, but there's only one week left because it took them so long to actually get everything in order. And it, it almost seemed like you had Undertaker and Kane come out in the opening segment, and then at the top of the hour you had Hunter and Austin come out and do an angle, and then you had an angle in the main event as well, and it was like they had three weeks' worth of build-up that they had to cram down into one show because it took them so long to get to this point. Plus they had to kind of build up the rest of the pay-per-view and ended up with every match being you know really short. You had the, uh, the submission match you were just talking about, I mean, that thing went two minutes, and then later on in the show, we had to watch Ivory and Trish have this match that was even longer, which served absolutely no purpose. And just a lot of things on the show, Big Show and Kai and Tai, and um, it's just like, you know, why waste a show putting these things on the air when you have more important matches to build up? Plus, why does Vince always wait so long to book these main events and then get in this position where he has to rush and, you know, do three angles on one show just to get over a main event that really nobody wants to see. Well, hopefully somebody wants to see it. I mean, one of the things... Well, I shouldn't say um, nobody wants to see it, but I don't. I mean, they added two matches for the pay-per-view, both of which we pretty much... Actually, we, yesterday's show we pretty much talked about, which was uh, the three Dudleys against the X Factor. God, those guys need new entrance music, don't they? Oh, they do. And um, Raven and Eddie Guerrero. Now, uh, you know, from a logical standpoint, the Raven, Eddie... Again, it depends on what they're doing today, but um, on SmackDown... But uh, there was no plan. I don't know how can I can explain this. What they did last night on Raw may end up making sense a week from today, but when they did it last night, um, 
it made no sense because those things that to make it make sense haven't been you know haven't even been decided yet. If Raven is to win the European title on Sunday, then the fact that Eddie pinned him clean with an Oklahoma side roll last night, um, I guess one could say okay, it, it sort of makes sense because Raven's getting the title anyway. But I mean yeah. the idea of where um, the champion who's a heel beats the challenger who's a face clean in the middle on the last major TV, depending of course, and they could do something on SmackDown that will make that inaccurate. But on the last Raw before the title match, it's almost like telling people, um, you know, I mean the cha- the challenger's not going to win anyway. I mean I guess it doesn't really matter. Well, in, in, it doesn't really. I don't think it really matters because it's like a mid card feud that's probably yeah, not you know, you're sell right. any right. pay per views. I mean if it were the main event. And you know the heel went over the baby face clean. That would be one thing, but you know Raven and uh, Eddie Guerrero yeah, right. it doesn't really matter. No, you know, but but, but yeah, but th- th- at the same time, it doesn't really build. It doesn't build any more anticipation when the challenger you know gets pinned clean in the middle, you know, without even a screw job. But you're right. I mean, I, as far I think as like, Raven will probably just take the belt. I mean, I, I've seen him do that a lot of times before, where it doesn't really make sense for that to happen, but then. You know, the other guy ends up winning the title, so in the end, well, that, it does that, make sense. But as far yeah. as a build, you know, yeah. that's not that wasn't that wasn't the plan as of uh, when they when they booked that finish, though. Mm-hmm. Just so you know, which is one of the reasons why I found it really weird. The um, the main event actually, the finish was changed, and um, I think the original finish, um, I think the original finish involved one of the young guys beating the old guys. Old being being a, 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 a term big um, and uh, but whatever it was the finish was clearly the, the finish that they did um, was I don't want to say the, they, they probably may have had many different finishes but the finish was changed the day of the show to uh, the conventional conservative finish which was Austin giving Matt the stunner and then Hunter pinning him as opposed to a kind of a more daring finish to elevate someone and I can understand being that the four guys who are who who are in the pay per view main event. Well, actually, I take that back. There are ways you could have done it. You could have done it. it you could have done it differently. Well, you could no. You could have had um, you could have had somebody pin like Jeff or Matt pin Austin or Hunter. Oh well, yeah, and just, it doesn't matter if one of those guys that's in the main event gets pinned. If it's done where Undertaker sets it up, because you don't want to. If for the heart, if the Hardys were to actually do a move and beat Hunter or Austin, then they should be in the main event. It should be a three-way. And since the decision was made not to do that. And not to make the main event a three-way, unless they change it this morning because they they had a booking meeting before SmackDown. Um, then there is no point in confusing the issue. Um, mm. You know, I mean, it, it, well, it, couldn't they it, have done something like? Um, well, I guess that probably wouldn't work. It would take heat off the main event. But I was thinking something like, you know, one of the Hardys gets a win, and then you know the decision is made on TV. We'll put these guys in the main event, but instead. Hunter and Austin just absolutely destroy him again, and they they miss the pay per view, but it sets up matches with those guys down the road. That could be done. There's no reason not to. Well, it's um, it sets something up for after the pay per view. Gives an injury yeah. angle. Gives them a comeback. Then they and they get the win. If they get the win. But I think the idea is is that they don't want Austin or um, Hunter doing a job because I'm presuming one of them is going to do a job on Sunday uh, to lose the title. You know, so doing a job for like a mid card type of guys before they're doing the job for the main guys. If they were going to go over. And, um, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's, it's kind of a weird chess game, but I, I mean, I, I can understand not having the Hardys beat one of those guys on TV last night because of the pay per view and what the match is, since the Hardys are not in the pay per view main event. If they were going to make the pay per view a three way, uh, you then, then you could have done it, but that yeah. wasn't the decision. Anyway, I mean, there, Rod's there were two it, spots about the main event last night that I really hated. The first one was when, you know, Hunter and Austin are calling out Undertaker and Kane, and the Hardys come out. And they come out on the ramp, and, you know, they're doing whatever. And it's like Hunter and Austin are looking at them like they're, and they're two laughing. mid-card geeks that they don't they're even care about. Like, what a threat. And then and Undertaker then, and Kane come out, and they just look totally petrified. And, and they run away. Yeah, and they run away. And then later on in the match, which I don't even know why they did this, Jeff is, like, wrestling Christian or something, and Christian tags in Kane. And instead of being, like, the tough baby face who goes after the big guy, Jeff just runs away and tags in Undertaker. And uh, or tags in whoever he was with, but it was just like why why have the babyface run away and look like you know he's scared to death of the big guys, and then why have the heels look at these little guys like they're nothing, and then look at the big guys like you know they're real threats. It's just another way of keeping these guys down. Yeah, uh, I, I mean I didn't like the dynamic of those guys coming out, and I mean it, it's, it would have been one thing if those guys were when those guys started laughing. I sort of saw what I thought would be a good idea where they're laughing. And then the Hardys go in there and actually kick their ass, but I was kind of going... Like last but, week? Yeah, but I was kind of thinking, that's not going to happen because they're not in the pay-per-view main event. So, 
so in that sense, it doesn't make sense to happen. But that at least would make sense for them to laugh at him. Okay. And then, but then when Undertaker and Kane come out for that angle, you know, you're just kind of going to the, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, it just makes them out to be such, you know, second rate guys, I guess is the, the term. Yeah. Yep. Real, real quick, let me go through the ratings. Uh, Raw did a 5 1, Heat did a 1 7, and Livewire and Superstars both did 1 1s. Um, the Raw main event, the eight man tag, did a 5 6, and that was slightly above, and when I say slightly, it's, like 120,000 more viewers than the submission match, which did a 5-5. Five five. Uh, pretty, you know, no, nothing new on the ratings. The same numbers last week. Um, just about almost identical number, actually. And uh, let me see. I mean, the, you know, grew in the first hour. There's this interesting pattern now. The, 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 it grows in the first hour, which it always did. And then it curtails in the second hour, which it used to not do. And this one went pretty far down the... Um, you know, they dropped a lot. The uh, Trish Stratus Ivory match was a big drop. Uh, they did not do well for the XFL recap feature. Shock, <laughs> shock of shocks. And then they picked up to a 5 6 for the main event. So they, they did get a, a decent main event pickup. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's that. Let me just see if there's any other stuff to get to. Um, it looks like the XFL game did a 1.9 rating. Um, it's being, on the, this is the Fast Nationals. I don't have the Final Nationals. They may come out, uh, I think they probably did just come out, but I didn't get them. Um, the the NBC did a 2-1, but we talked about this yesterday, that the first 15 minutes of the two hours was the NBA game, and the NBA game did like a big, not a big number, but a bigger number than the XFL. So it kind of brought the night up for, for NBC. But it, it looks like it did about a 1-9, so, I mean, what, whatever that is. Lex Luger was on uh, a sports talk show this morning. They were talking about performance-enhancing drugs in sports, and they actually never talked to Lex about doing them other than he said that it would be really stupid for kids to do steroids or even for kids to lift weights because he said that Dr. Ant, Dr. James Andrews, you know, who uh, fixes all the wrestlers when they fall apart um, in Birmingham, told him that until you're fully grown, you should not do weight training, which is really interesting uh, because, you know, co you know, commonly, you know, all high school athletes are doing weight training, aren't they, Brian? I would think so. Yeah. And he said I was thinking I was 14. But it may have stunted yeah, my growth. Yeah, I probably started about uh, started. You know, started I'll, I'll go for the whole 15. deal about steroids will stunt the growth of a kid, but I don't think weight training will. Why would weight training stunt your growth? I think if you did heavy squats while um you were for, while while you were first growing, it might um it might. I don't know. I mean, I, I think up know. and down. I don't, like, I don't know how that would work. When your I was a kid, just get we, so big that your bone is unable to grow. Know that the pressure on the on the bone, the pressure of of doing um, stuff when you're vertical. I mean, when I was a kid, we were always told that not to do military presses and heavy squats, um, you know, too young because it would stunt your, your it would stunt your growth. I don't know if that was an old wives' tale, but that's what we were told. I think a lot of it is like you know, a lot of people say, just look at gymnasts, look at how small they are when they do this their whole life and they're you know they're working their muscles from the age of five yeah, or whatever. But they're starving. But I'm around too. them all the time, and there there are a lot of very tall gymnasts that uh, lift weights, and I don't think that has anything to do with it. It's just that the ones that make it to the top level are not six foot five. Because of the natural, just just as the people who you make it to the top level, of, uh, just as the yeah, people who make the, the top level of the NBA far, are not five foot three. are just tiny human beings. Yeah, uh, Luger said that he once tried creatine, but all it did was bloat him. I thought that was quite <laughs> amusing. Yes. Yes. Anyway, um, Lee Haney was on. Speaks. I'll have yeah. yeah. The um, um, when they, when he talked about his status, he said that he still got a year left on his Time Warner contract, and since the WWF is not offering big guarantees, he feels that it's in his best incentive to sit out the year and then wait for the WWF to call him when his contract is up, which is a nice oh, way of. Oh yes. Nice way of saying what it is. Don't forget, tomorrow we're going to be live from the uh, UPW show in uh, Santa Ana, California. We're going to have a whole bunch of guests on. Uh, throughout that show. I'm not sure who they will all be, but there's a lot of people I'm looking forward to talking to, and many of them will be on this show. And uh, what other, I don't think there's anything else we should uh, bring up as far as, uh, I don't know, as far as the show last night, I didn't think there was any particularly, there was no particularly great wrestling. Main event was okay. Uh, conservative finish, as we talked about. The submission match was way too short. The uh, Steph, uh, no, the uh, Trish Stratus match with Ivory was pretty hideous. And everything else, Kai, Kai and Ty, everything went as expected. You know, uh, RTC is continuing their losing streak, and uh, there was supposed to be a booking meeting today to finish up the pay-per-view lineup. Nothing more uh, was announced last night that we pretty much didn't have figured already. Uh, just trying to think if there's anything else. ESPN Classics is doing a special on Dan Gable. Um, 
Stu Hart got out of the hospital yesterday. Um, he needs an oxygen tank um, to help him with breathing, so he's in pretty rough shape. Uh, anything else before we? I think that's it. We now this poll for the for yesterday um, or today's or, or whatever yesterday's poll was maybe the scariest results of a poll that I have seen. Um, Brian, have you have you gotten these results yet? No, I haven't gotten them. Okay. With the demise of ECW and WCW, has your interest in wrestling declined greatly, 23%, declined a little, 48%. And wow. 71% of the people responded saying their interest in wrestling has declined literally in the last month. Increased a little, 3%. Increased a lot, 3%. Did not make a difference, 23%. Increased a lot? Hey, don't, don't have to watch... How can your really increase with uh, two less promotions? I will say I, I spend guess no, interest in seeing what they're going to do with WCW. Yeah, if you be. didn't care about it before, and now there's a chance that WWF might be running it somewhat, uh, you know, with some competence. Or you could say that because you're no longer watching these promotions, you're spending your time watching something else that you uh, that's wrestling that you find that's better. It's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, if nothing else, EMLL logically is certainly a lot a lot less frustrating than WCW. Mm -hmm. and stylistically, and the, the, and the matches are better most of the time, too. Not always. Triple A with the heel refs, though. I don't know about that. Uh, I, I didn't say Triple A. <laughs> triple A is real uh, tough. I, I was getting so angry watching the uh, Ray de, uh, or was it Ray de Rays or whatever. Ray, Ray de Rays. King of Kings. Yeah. Anyway, I was yeah. watching the finals, and uh, Toronto is doing the heel ref bit. And I just hate the heel refs so much. It just drives me crazy. But they had the funniest spot. The fans were getting so angry at this guy that they're throwing garbage into the ring. And he started doing this spot where he dropped down to do a count, and he would stop at one to clear the garbage. Oh, oh to clear the, the ring. ring of garbage. I've seen him do that for I years. I thought that was so awesome. Yeah, I know. The um, the the other thing about the, the Ray de Reyes is that uh, six-sided ring. I yeah. just I mean, the wrestlers were uncomfortable in it, and it just, it, you know, you're just visually not used to seeing, you know, a six-sided ring. Uh, real quick, I want to mention that the um, poll question that's up today has to do with last night's Raw. It's, uh, A, uh, what did you think of last night's Raw? A, excellent, B, good, C, average, D, bad, E, awful. Um, let me see who we got up. Who do we, do we how, how many guys do we have up right now? We've got Ric Flair up. Okay. Ric Flair, how you doing today? Good, man. How are you, Dave? Hey, I'm doing really good. Rick, you know, I wanted to bring you on here for a number of reasons, of course. Number one, uh, to, to discuss Johnny Valentine, who I would think a lot of the listeners aren't really familiar with. A lot of the older listeners clearly are. And uh, when you started in the business, I mean, he was, you know, he certainly was one of the top guys. He certainly was. And I, he uh, actually, I think he was probably held in as high as esteem as anybody. He was, you know, the, one of the Buddy Rogers guys that, uh, of that era, Pat O'Connor, Buddy Rogers, Vern Gagne, Bobo Brazil. I mean, there were a bunch of them that were big stars, UConn, Eric, um, and Johnny was one of them, and he, uh, you know, had, had huge notoriety in the Southwest, uh, meaning Texas. He worked a lot in Florida for Eddie Graham. He worked a lot in New York for Vincent Rand Sr. And then, uh, uh, somehow, and of course, he was a huge card in St. Louis for Sam Mushnick. And then I was fortunate enough to meet him when he came down south, uh, into the Carolinas for Jim Crockett, um, kind of towards the end of his career. Actually, probably not the end of his career, but, he probably could have wrestled another 10 years, but kind of on a wind, on a wind down. He'd been everywhere else except the South, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be here at the same time that he came down. So it was a great experience for me. How about you his measurements? Because I know he's listed as like, uh, you know, 6'4 and 250, tan, like a guy that could be a star pretty much in any era. Uh, I, I would I say 6'3, 250, maybe 6'3. He was tall, he was lean. He had uh, really gotten himself in good shape. I'd only seen pictures of him over the years, but he'd gotten himself in real good shape because of a minor heart problem back then. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't stop him from having a good time, but he watched his diet, and he he was, uh, you know, real conscious of his appearance. He was working out, and uh, he looked great. You know, he had uh, had that, that phenomenal look. You know, some of the guys have got it and some don't. Johnny Valentine had that look. His hair looked was the same. He was always kept it looking nice, and uh you know, he, he and Ray Stevens and Buddy Rogers and guys of that era all had that same hair, you know, and it looked great. And uh, Johnny had a great appearance. He, he was know, one, the I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing, you know, your style, 
uh, I think I think maybe a lot of your style as far as the certain you know believability and as far as the real hard hitting, which I guess you you know picked up in a lot with Wahoo and Wahoo and Johnny Valentine. Of course, you were telling me earlier today about uh, when you first broke into the Carolinas. You know, yeah. the Wahoo McDaniel, John, I mean, even to this day, the older for the older fans, Wahoo McDaniel, Johnny Valentine matches everyone talks about. They just killed each other. Unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it anywhere from Japan to, uh, I mean, wherever I've been, I've never seen anything. The battles between Wahoo and uh, Valentine, I can still, you know, I can still see them in my mind. I can visualize them, and uh, they were unbelievable. And not only were they brutal, they were 35, 45, and 60 minutes long. I mean, they were just phenomenal matches, and... The place was sold out, and I mean nobody moved, and two guys were bleeding, and one guy was—I mean, it was just Wahoo had phenomenal timing. For, the, for a lot of the audience, probably doesn't know Wahoo McDaniel, which is really sad. But aside from being a phenomenal football player, Wahoo was a tremendous performer in our business. And uh, the one thing that Wahoo had was unlimited guts and, and uh, a lot of heart. And he just wouldn't stop. I mean, that's that's what that's what Valentine got out of a baby face. He made a baby face fight. And, I mean, fight. And fight and fight and fight just stayed on him. He was brutal. And, uh, but if a guy wasn't willing to stand up to John, cause John smacked, John smacked you across the back of the neck and across the chest. I mean, he, a lot of guys didn't like working with Johnny because he was so stiff, but he, uh. Was it more just yeah. stiff or was, you know, was he ever really dangerous or just really no, no, lay everything no, no. in? But a big, oh, there's a huge difference between the word stiff and dangerous. Mm -hmm. He he wasn't suplexing anybody on top of the head. He just beat him up. I mean, he had, he had a, he, he had like a, a half rabbit punch, then he had that that kidney punch in the back. But it was, you know, it was just his way of laying it in. I mean, he had, he had a style. But mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell you right now, Wahoo McDaniel's hit him back every, you know, just as hard. He could stand up to anything. He was a, and he and he never covered up. He stayed open, and that's what you know. When the people, once the people realized that, I mean, he was the kind of guy that made sure that everybody walked out of the building saying wrestling was real. And Wahoo was the same way. I mean. You know, I've seen Wahoo do everything from cut his ear to cut his shoulder, I mean, to cut his chest. I mean, he was just a – Wahoo was a very believable guy. And when he wrestled Valentine, when the two of them got in place, man, it was impossible. That's why they enjoyed such huge success out in Texas. They just went from, uh, you know, from Dallas to Fort Worth to San Antonio to Houston and had huge matches in front of huge crowds. And, and Johnny, of course – was the epitome of a challenger for the world championship and, and, and a great, a great bad guy. And now when he was over to the point where the people started to like him, he was a great good guy. He was a, just phenomenal. But he never changed his style. He didn't believe in being whipped across the ring. He didn't duck elbows and cross body people. He didn't, he didn't believe in any of that. I didn't learn anything about my work except intensity from Johnny Valentine. I was, I was a Ray Stevens guy. <laughs> It was a lot easier to you know, go upside. It was a lot easier to go upside down than it was to get hit across the back of the neck. <laughs> Valentine. I mean, he was he was just a big a big rugged guy. You know, we we got a, we got a bunch of other people who were also on the line that I wanted to bring on with you, Rick. Uh, we got uh, Red Bastine, Larry Madison from St. Louis, and also Les Thatcher, who all have a lot of things to say about Johnny Valentine. And uh, before we go on with with everyone, I, I want to get this out of the way because. You were in the plane crash that ended Johnny Valentine's career. In fact, uh, were you sitting like right behind him or something? What was? I, John, I was sitting right behind Johnny. It was a six-passenger plane. It was a Cessna 310, the sixth-place plane, and we uh, we took off from Charlotte, headed for Wilmington, North Carolina. For it was a sellout crowd, and uh, as a matter of fact, I think Red was there in Wilmington that night. And Red Bastine, can Red hear me now? Dave? Yes, I can hear you. Well, Red Bastien, you're the man, buddy. I was telling you you were going to be on the line tonight, but if anybody can tell Johnny Valentine's stories, it would be Red Bastien. And I want to go on record, ladies and gentlemen, of saying that Red Bastien is one of the greatest performers in the history of this business and a legend for a number of reasons. Well, thank you. I emulated <laughs> you all the time because you were always my idol. Uh, I remember you when I was a kid. Well, listen, we need to hook up one night and just tell them about Ray Stevens all night long. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, actually, we should probably do that sometime. We need to. It would be we great. Do more air time, Dave. We talk about Ray for a night. <laughs> we should. We should really. We should do that because yeah, you, you. There's too many stories to tell in one night, or even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's good to hear your voice, man. It's good to hear from you, Rick. And listen, I want you to come to the Cauliflower Alley Club. Well, I would love to come. I'm not retired yet, man. I'm going to have another run. You don't have to. I'm wrestling the Rock at WrestleMania. You guys are not going to retire me yet, man. 
<laughs> See, that's the stigma that's attached to the Cauliflower Alley Club. Everyone thinks when you join it, you're retired, but yeah, that's not yeah. the case. I'm, that's what Penny Manor tells me every time I see her. You're retired. Come out to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. Well, yeah, I tell you, Red, when, when Dave asked me about Johnny Valentine, you're the first guy who came to mind. I can't tell the story, but it's one of the great stories of all time. And I, <laughs> I, can't tell either, but I know the story. We, we, we had some great trips, man. I, oh. I was telling Dave that myself and you and some of the other guys would take Johnny to the towns, you know, and, you know, he was, you know, he was, he was completely immobilized at that time from the waist down, so he did it in a wheelchair around crutches, but, John loved the business, man. He, he just loved to travel with the guys. And it was a, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal man. But it, Red Basti can tell you better than I, better than I can how stiff he was. Uh, I'll tell you, you, you had to fight for your life. <laughs> you had to fight for your life because he, 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 if there's no powder punch puffs with him, punches with him because he laid them in and boy, you better, you better get ready. Be up for it. You know, Red, you you living in Texas had seen Johnny over the last year, and could you like kind of detail to everyone like you know, ever since in, in 1975, uh, Johnny was in the plane crash with Ric Flair and um, and never walked again after that plane crash. It ended his wrestling career, and he was at the time he was U.S. champion, he was the top draw in the Carolinas, and um, you know, in the last what's been year, last couple of years, his health has really deteriorated. And uh, could you kind of bring everyone up to date on what's been happening with Johnny? Yeah, actually. Uh... You know, he's he had some internal problems and everything. His colon balls were tied up and everything like that. Aside from the fact that he couldn't walk, you know, and then he was still training and working out with his upper body and stuff like that, you know, doing curls and some uh, shoulder work and all that stuff. But, um, you know, he, he got in some complicated stuff from internal things, and uh, he, he went downhill. And Ray Stern and I went over to see him one day, and this has been about, oh, a couple of months ago now, I would say, and and uh, he's not too far from us. Well, I'm living in Dallas, as is Ray Stern, and uh, uh, it's about 30 miles over there to Fort Worth, which is where he was. So uh, we went over there, and when, when we walked out, we're walking down the hall, and we both had tears in our eyes. It just we just couldn't believe that the guy was hanging on, and he hung on and hung on, and and we got in the car, and Ray says. I don't think we'll ever see him again. And gee, he kept on after that, kept on and on, and you know, and he just—he was just tough. He didn't want to give up, and he never did. You know, I—I I, I respect him so much because he—he he, he set another precedent and another took wrestling to another level. And I saw so many guys try to emulate him in, in my career, watching other guys wrestle, but nobody could do it. They all tried, but they couldn't do it. <laughs> Am I right, Rick? No, you're totally right. I just he had a he was so unique. I mean, it's, I mean, I I tell people this and they don't they, they I don't think they believe me, but I mean, you take you take Valentine and Ray and I mean, a lot of us have tried to duplicate all their stuff, uh, but I mean, nobody could. I mean, my myself or anybody else. I mean, those those, those were a couple of guys and I just stand out in my mind big time um, as two guys that were, they were opposite totally in terms of the style of work, but. Um, and they just uh, were two guys who were never duplicated. A lot of they guys did. tried, but it never really happened. That, you, that reinforces that uh, little saying that's often imitated but never exactly. duplicated. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. In, in this day and age, Johnny, Johnny's style of work would have been probably called unacceptable. He would have said he couldn't work, but he was, I guess what you would call Ray, or, or Red, uh, the master of psychology, which is a word that's not used very much for, very much in our business. But Johnny would Johnny would hang on to a guy and, Hold him down, and I mean, he wouldn't be. He'd tell him to kick his foot and move his leg, and tell him to move his little finger. But if he didn't do it at the right time, Johnny just grab you and squeeze your head, and just said, "Not yet." You know what I mean? And, and he wanted that crowd to believe the guy was down. And, but, and I'll tell you what: twenty minutes later, if they weren't familiar with his style, they did believe it. <laughs> that, that sort of is there, <laughs> is there anybody you could compare that style to today? Maybe like a Regal, just you know, working him over, pounding on him, a lot of mat work. No, but I can. I, I think Steve Regal, if he were, you know, the problem is you can't wrestle like that on TV anymore. You can't wrestle like that in the arenas because they don't want you to. In terms mm-hmm. of time, it, t- it took Johnny Valentine 20 minutes just to get. He'd look at his opponent sometimes for 10 minutes. He wouldn't even tie up. But when the time when he tied up, he, you know, he might grab the guy and not let him go for 20 minutes. I mean, it Steve was... Regal has got the same psychology in terms of being physical, 
a little bit different, and Steve does a lot, a lot of fancy stuff that Johnny would never do. But I mean, yeah, Steve's a real physical, intense guy. But that, and that's, it's just hard to explain. Uh, Johnny was just Johnny just beat you up. I mean, he hits you as hard as he could. You better be in shape. I'm all in the nose or the eyes, but he hits you in the back of the neck or the that side punch. I mean, he just knocked the crap out of you. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> it's hard to explain. A lot of guys didn't like work with him. Am I saying that right, Red? Oh yeah, I can remember one time here in Dallas. Uh, he's pounding the hell out of me, and, and uh, so I made a, a big, strong comeback, and I'm punching. I'm giving it everything I got. And I look up at him, and he's smiling. Yeah. He loved it. <laughs> yeah, he, he loved it. He, he, he had you know, goosebumps on his body. I said, Jesus yeah. Christ, what am I getting into here? The bigger the goosebumps would get. I want to bring I want to bring on uh, Larry Matisik from St. Louis, and of course Les Thatcher, who we've had, we both had on the show many many times, who are very familiar. Have seen Johnny wrestle countless times. Sorry, with Larry. Larry, you know. St. Louis, he was a, uh, you know, he was one of those, you know, top five, ten headliners of that '60s and '70s era. Oh, absolutely, and uh, hey guys, great to be on with Red and, and, yeah, and, and what, a, what, a, what a Hall of Fame gathering this is. Believe <laughs> me, uh, yeah, I grew up watching Johnny Valentine in the early '60s wrestle people like Buddy Rogers, Lou Thez, Fritz von Erich, Dick the Bruiser, and Rick said something, maybe about five minutes ago, that was so true. If you ever had any doubt if wrestling was real, and remember, I was a teenage kid back then, and I wanted to believe, and I was arguing with all my classmates, hey, this stuff's real, this stuff's real. Once they saw Valentine, nobody argued. Once he laid it in, everybody up in the top row of Keel Auditorium in St. Louis knew Johnny had popped somebody. Yeah, he, he was just an incredible, incredible master of that crowd. And when I started doing ring announcing and doing the work with Sam Muchnick, uh, I think I appreciated it even more how well he understood the psychology of what worked for Johnny Valentine, and he was awesome in there. You know, I Les, remember Red Bastien wrestling Buddy Austin here too. So don't don't get cocky now, Red. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to bring on Les because Les, in almost every time Les is on the show, has been on the show, he's brought up the name Johnny Valentine as kind of an example of timing, and also as an example of a guy when, when I guess Les was in the Carolinas at the time when Johnny first came, and they didn't understand what he did at the beginning. And he taught them what he did, and they learned to they learned to accept it, and he ended up being the biggest drawing card in the territory. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, and he had, you know, he was a smart guy, and I don't, I wouldn't have been able to say this when I first started in the business, but he was a smart guy. He came at the same time Wahoo did, because Johnny needed a guy he could beat up that could fight back, and Wahoo was the guy, and it, it, it worked out great for both of them because it it got Wahoo. There weren't a lot of guys like this, like, <laughs> like that Wahoo chopping the crap out of me. I mean. The, the Wahoo wasn't shy about knocking you in the ground either. Not at all. <laughs> Am I saying yeah. that right, Red? You got that right. Can these guys hear me, David? Yeah, they, we can all hear you, Les. Let's go. Right, yeah. wanna... First of all, I want to Nate, you're still the man, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Les. How are you, buddy? And I'm Druid, brother. And Redhead, I'd love to see you again. Well, I'd love to see you. Come to the Cauliflower Alley Club, I know. My I, got, I got your message. <laughs> uh, I want, David, I want to tell you about the Redhead. Uh, when I was a kid buying tickets, oh, actually, I'm only two years younger than Red, but when I was buying tickets, he and Ray Stevens were like a tennis match. These were the, the original flyers. Him and Ray would hit the ring uh, in a tag match. Ray was Roy Shire's partner here in Cincinnati, and uh, Red and Lou, and Red and Ray would just take to the air, man. They were quite a sight to see. I've been grounded since then. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry, uh, of course, you're with one of the, the great classic promotions of all time. Well, appreciate it. Hey, it was a, I wish I knew, I knew then what I know now. Maybe I'd have been smarter and had more fun, cause what a time it was. Cause seeing yeah. guys, guys like Rick coming into the business, and I can still remember Rick's first matches in St. Louis, but seeing Valentine. And when you talked about Johnny working that crowd, I still remember him and Harley Race. They get in a front face lock for like 15 minutes, and after the show, you guys probably remember old Wild Bill Longson, who would sit back up on the stage sure. with Sam. Bill coming over to me, and he's saying, oh, Sam was having a heart attack. He wanted me to run down and see if they were okay. They were okay. But when Johnny finally broke, broke free, that crowd was just ready to march. He could have, he could have taken 10,000 people right down Market Street to the arch, and they'd all, come, they'd all follow him. <laughs> That's the truth. You know, I was telling some of the kids here that I trained today when I found out about this. We were talking about Johnny. And I had my first match with him here at uh, Old Channel 9 on TV. And I was just, you know, just a young kid, jobber then. And, of course, had bought tickets to see him. And uh, came back out. You know, we stayed probably out there five, six minutes for a TV match. We came back, and Les Ruffin was the booker. Les came in, hey, kid, good job. And I said, what did I do to make him mad? 
He said, oh, no, kid, he's not mad. That's just the way he works. So that was my first run in with Johnny. But they're right. I've been listening to Rick. And, I mean, he laid him in. Rick, uh, Red, you guys, what I've told David before was when George Scott first brought Johnny into the Carolinas because it was such a predominantly a tag team territory that the people were used to seeing all the high spots from the tag teams and the action. And when they first started getting Johnny over, you'd see some of the old uh, fans getting up and leaving in the middle of his matches because we all know he didn't even get warmed up till 20 minutes in. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. uh, But then a year later, he was selling out all those same venues, right? Yeah, and those people that walked out were back. And, and, and bringing their friends. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, Larry, you ought to be me trying to walk around the dressing room now, trying to tell the guys about St. Louis on a Friday night. You give me five grand after the main event and go down the landing and spend them ten. Yeah, I, I can't <laughs> remember this. I remember you and me and Vicki Murdoch walking across Market and Street and the Blizzard one night. Down, I had to stay till Monday. <laughs> <laughs> it was a different kind of town, and Les made a good point. Well, I guess Paul Bosch maybe in Houston. It was a great time. You know what? It was a phenomenal time, and... Johnny Valentine needs to be remembered as being one of the main guys that was part of that and helped develop Absolutely. it. And yeah, Johnny was awesome. Johnny was, and, you know, I, mean, and, I grew and, up on him. So many people grew up on him right here. Yeah. Oh, he was you the know, greatest you know, the, talent in the world. He was a big part of it. Yeah, the thing that nobody's mentioned was during that time after the plane crash, when he was on those crutches, I know for a couple years thereafter, he could would keep telling you he was coming back. Oh, yeah. I he mean, there was no red way red in the world you could tell him he was red. Yeah. <laughs> he was he, he had that bulldog determination for sure. But, Unbelievable. But there's some things you can't overcome. No. Had the crash not occurred, how many years do you think he had left as like an active wrestler? I think he could have wrestled for, for an unlimited period of time in, in the Carolinas until such time as uh, Dusty started booking it because Dusty booked a different style than Johnny Valentine. Mm -hmm. But I think I think under the George Scott era, he could have wrestled. He could have. Russell at least another, let me see, another eight, nine years. You know what I mean? I mean, he was over. And, he, and if Dusty had been smart, which he would have probably been at that time, he would have kept Johnny on because by that time he would have been a huge attraction on the other side. And whoever was the guy that they had to they had put him in the ring with, Johnny would have been the guy to, to match him up against. Because he really, he was, I think Red, you were there that night that they had the U.S. tournament for his belt. Yes. I mean, and my God, I mean, I, nobody expected it. I think they stood and cheered for John Valentine for 15 minutes. Um, I'm not sure if you were there or not, Les, but yes. I, I was not there, but I heard that the ovation they gave him was 15 minutes long uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I think all, all the guys were there for the U.S. title I think, match. Wasn't that red? Wasn't that when you first came into the territory that time? Yes. I thought so. Yeah, yeah. And Johnny could have come back to St. Louis any time. You know how they treated people like Gene Kaniski and Dick the Bruiser. Come in every nine, ten months, work one or two hot stuff, sure. hot things, and he'd, he'd have lasted there for another eight, nine years. The loudest crowd I ever heard to this day goes back to like 71 or 72 when he won the, it was the Missouri State title from Harley Race then. And, I mean, I was deafened as a ring announcer for like two days afterwards. I couldn't hear. I didn't know a crowd could be that loud. Yeah. Yeah, he was the kind of heel then that, I mean, performer. you had to respect him. If he stayed in your territory long enough, the yeah. fans may boo him, but they had to respect what he was. I just want to go through uh, one thing that I just to do with something that we talked about before these guys were on the show. This is from a guy named Kevin who goes, I'm a pre-med student, and according to all documented evidence I have come across, the skeletal structure is affected by large muscle, st muscle growth in its developmental stage. So that's what he said. Uh, hmm. we got other people who wrote in, don't believe it. As a matter of fact, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just, you know, that's and actually that's an interesting that's an interesting thought there. Uh, let me just see. Uh, hey Rick, does Reed do any weight training? Big pardon? Does Reed do any weight training? Yes. As a matter of fact, he's uh, this is the first year I've let him start doing some stuff in the, with his lower back, like deadlifts and power cleans. But he's been mm -hmm. he's been doing bench presses, uh, pull ups, uh, dips, and curls. And light leg presses for about the last two years. So that's. And I, and How I, big I'll, is he now? Huh? How big is he now? He's uh, five five and a half. Weighs 151 pounds. Wow. And so what's his what's his wrestling what's his wrestling weight at right now? Well, he wrestled. He started out the year at 135, but that was he he weighed about 141 in, in December, and then broke his ankle. I think I told you about it, Dave. He broke his ankle, so it kind of laid him up for a while and. This is the slowest year we've had. I think it was really you know, set him back, and he's going through that 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 age right now. Where until he hits puberty, he's wrestling against kids that are 15 years old. So it was a tough year for me. I ended up 
I think, 46 and 8, which was, a, was still a great year for him, but he, he never lost more than two matches in a year for the last five years. So it was hard for him, but he's, he's growing and uh, he's committed, and I think he understands that, uh, um, that he has to you know, make a commitment one way or the other uh, if he wants to be, you know, be a Division One athlete. And he likes, he likes wrestling a lot. He likes football. So he'll, it'll, it'll play out for him. He enjoys it, and uh, we, we really have a good time doing it together. So. And I used to, you know, I was probably was a little bit, I probably pushed him a little bit too hard a couple of years ago, but it's nothing I don't think that he hasn't realized in terms of reward. So he's doing great and uh, having a good time, and uh, he's healthy. And uh, to answer your question, he is, he is weight training. And it, I didn't hear the part of the show, but if you were talking about doctors, I've talked to every orthopedic surgeon in the country that knows anything about it. And they all, you know, talk about protecting the growth cradle with kids. And uh, they shouldn't be doing squats or deadlifts and stuff like that until they're big enough to do them because that, that of course, affects the growth cradle. But he's grown a lot in the last year, and, I, and not not just due to weightlifting, but just the fact that he's growing up to be a young man. So yeah, the answer now, is yes, he is. Before we, before we go on with Johnny Valentine, I know everybody wants to ask the question, is uh, the status of Ric Flair right now as far as going to WWF, uh, you know, what you've heard from Time Warner, which actually hasn't been anything, I guess, and just where, where everything stands right now. It, I, it's totally in limbo. It's a, it's a real strange time right now. We, you know, they closed the doors, and uh, we had that last Nitro in Panama City, and I don't think, uh, you know, with the, I, I can't say for sure, but I don't think any of the guys that are contracted uh, with the kind of deal that I have, which is, uh, you know, you know, we were all real fortunate to have those deals to begin with, but... The, uh, the no cut contracts. Uh, I don't think anybody has heard some from them. I think that they were hoping we'd all be calling, wanting to settle to go to WBF, which you know I, I think probably you know five years ago I would have I would have settled period and just you know hope for the best. But right now, uh, because I'm not going to call Flower yet, no matter how bad red, how bad red, 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 red wants me to come, I'm not going until I wrestle the Rock. <laughs> <laughs> well. Listen, the Cauliflower Alley Club's been going for many, many years, Rick. We can yeah, I wait. Know. No, I just, uh, I, I, I just, you know, I'd like to go, but I, I, I think like myself and a few of the other guys, Goldberg, it's pretty hard to leave the money on the table, uh, just to go up and, and uh, you know, my, my ego and everything else is I want to be there. But number one, they haven't officially made me an offer. Number two, Time Warner is telling us we can't do anything. Uh, we're getting paid by them, so that's that's where we stand. Yeah, that also would r rule out. Just, just a, like a, a Japan tour or working an independent program or anything like that. You basically can't. You, you basically can't do anything unless they schedule it, right? I can do, I can do speaking appearances and I can do uh, autograph sessions, like for car dealerships and stuff like that, which I'll continue to do. But I can't do anything wrestling wise. Um, that's How about charity shows? Beg pardon? How about charity shows? Uh, I don't think so. I think they're looking for any reason in the world less to, to breach the. I mean, that's what I've been told to that's, breach. The that's contract. what I was afraid of because. Steamboat and I were conjuring up a, a Legends match for the next film. Yeah. Yeah, We and we had uh, you with Ricky in your corner against yeah. Bobby Eaton with Cornette in his corner. Yeah, I, just, I would love to do that. And I, as a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, if I didn't, if I thought that, that my whole thing was to sit here for two years and never be able to go to, to, to Vince McMahon, I would really seriously consider getting with the people that I've met in the last couple of years here in Charlotte and uh, opening up Charlotte again. You know, it's going to go, I, I think unless another major company comes along, which is going to be difficult to establish in the name recognition within the next two years, that the local territories, they wouldn't run it like they would in, in, the, in the late 80s. But you could draw, you know, 2,500, 3,000. I can name 10 towns right now. You could draw those kind of numbers with just with Steamboat and uh, 10 other guys that are all unemployed. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you can't draw. I'm not saying 10,000 people, but 3,000 wouldn't be unrealistic at all in a lot of towns. Throughout the, the southeast, so I, mean, I, I think I'd do something like that, if it, you know, rather than uh, you know venture off with a new company. I mean, there's been all kinds of opportunities right now that are out there, and that none of them are in writing yet. But I think a lot of guys are trying to explore. I, I, the guy that's promoting Australia, I think, did pretty well, didn't he, Dave? With Henning, uh, with the, the I Generation guys. Yeah, the guy was the guy that Rodman and Henning and those guys, and they draw pretty well over they, there. They did very well, and they did very well in Australia, but they didn't do well in pay per view. Oh, okay, I didn't you know, know in this in, the, in this country, but the Pacific Rim is wide open, and there are people talking about running that. And uh, oh, around the know. world, there is there is a market there for around the world because the WWF is is very popular on TV everywhere, yeah. and there are a lot of places where WCW. You know, WCW. You know, we look back 
they probably could have done some real big business in Australia and England this year had they not shut down and just like cultivated new markets. Um, but they just, well, for many reasons, they just didn't do it. I think there's a lot of promoters see pay-per-views as big cash cow, and it really isn't unless you're Vince. Exactly. And you've got to have a built-in audience. I mean, Vince's whole pay-per-view, unless I'm wrong, is based on the numbers that he's drawn on Monday night and, and, and Wednesday night or Thursday night. That's the yeah. audience buying the shows. You just can't go out and invent an audience because you're running a pay-per-view. Unless I'm wrong, correct me. But I mean, he's got to. Oh, I, I totally, agree. I totally agree that you need real strong TV now. And also, the other thing is, is that you, you need stars that the general public knows, um, because, you know, new that are on TV. Not, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough. It's, I think the business is the Plus toughest it's ever been. Yeah, people have the expectation because of the production. That that also makes it it's a more expensive business to run too. Well, sure. I, out of sight, out of mind is the greatest. You know, that to me, that's the greatest expression of our business. If you're, if you're off TV for a year in this business right now. And I don't care who you are. There's a lot of you're going to lose some of the new fans that come in. I mean, I have people tell me that all the time, and it's funny because um, you, know, you think we've been on TV forever. Up until a couple of years ago, I would have believed that, but now. With the, with the new new wave of the new generation of people that watch our show, I'm sure there's always going to be the people that know who you are, but there's a lot of people that don't. I mean, I find that even here in Charlotte, you know, as alarming as it might be. <laughs> 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 I can't get a free drink ever anymore, Red. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, Nate, uh, since what? Red's president of the Kyle Flower Alley Club, that's like being a booker. He might book you a farewell tour. Uh, I know. You know what? I, I, I would have to go somewhere with Red Bastine one more time in my life for about three days. <laughs> hey, the last time I took you for three <laughs> days, I <laughs> drove you to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> you and uh, Greg Gagne. <laughs> that was the best. You know, I just great hearing all these voices. I mean, I had I can tell you, Dave, I'm, and I won't take any more of your time like this, but I, with Larry Manizak, I have nothing but phenomenal memories and the we first class, the they, they ran St. Louis and Sam. And, I you know, Dusty and I were fortunate enough to work that that show that night that Sam had his retirement match, and it was, I mean, just phenomenal. I mean, his retirement, we worked the, 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 the title match right at his retirement. January 1st, 1982. I worked with Brody there. I worked with uh, Dick the Bruiser there. I mean, it's just a phenomenal time in my life that I really can't even, you, it, you can't convey those those times to people that weren't there because they don't believe it, you know what I'm saying, especially the, the generation now. But, um the funny thing, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't 50 years ago, it was just 20 years ago. That's the sad thing about it. It was, actually, it was 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, to, to have been fortunate enough to break into business when Red Bastine and Ray Stevens and Nick Bockwinkle and Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch and Larry Henning were all in the same territory. Don Morocco, Jimmy Snooker, you tell me. I had a pretty good time, guys. <laughs> it was a great business. And, was, and But I, I had so much respect for those guys because... Actually, I, the list of guys I just named, there's, there's nobody in the business who work as good as those guys right now. That's you know, one, th one, one, thing, one thing that you just brought, you brought up that just triggered something, um, I, I never knew this, but when Billy Graham first came from California to Minneapolis, yes. you set up his gym in his house, didn't you? I did, and my dad delivered his baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't, know, I didn't know that. My dad delivered his wife's first child, yeah. It's that, I mean, wow. we, it was a, just a great time. I mean, Wahoo was there. I mean, when I when I started, I, my eyes were bigger than Dallas, Texas. I mean, all these guys that I'd heard and seen and watched on TV here, I was, and they were all nice to me. I mean, you know, Red and I, I mean, Red, Red will laugh when I remember this story, but Red and I used to get on a that plane that was 30 below zero from Flying Cloud Airport and fly up to Bismarck with Larry Hainemi just following the road lights on the highway. I mean, remember that, Red? Amazing, yes, of course. But let me tell you something. I just got <laughs> back from Minnesota. Of wine and just opened the land somewhere. R Rick, I just got back from Minnesota last night, and I left Bemidji, Minnesota. It was There was eight inches of snow when I left there. They were uh, spraying the plane down and everything like that, so I get out. I was up there visiting my father. He yes. was still living. He's uh, 95 now. And, uh, God bless him. <laughs> they, they, oh, I didn't, couldn't believe it. When I got to Minneapolis, it was just raining, and I got back here to Dallas, uh, and the sun is out. And wonderful. What a difference. <laughs> yeah. You know, Red, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you something. What, what happened to your nephews that were, uh, your, Red had two nephews that were uh, outstanding amateur wrestlers. Well, yes, they were both Olympians, and uh, one of them, uh, the, not the third brother, uh, he would have been an Olympian himself, but he lost the... Uh, in the Olympic trials in one minute in overtime, and he lost the match. 
And, but, however, now he is the assistant head coach at the University of Minnesota. And he's the oh, one that what, goes out name, and recruits Rick? all the guys. And, by the way, Rick, you being a little Minnesota boy, let me tell you that uh, the Minnesota won the Nationals this oh, year. Oh, I know. And, and look, it's funny because my I sponsored a guy the last three years, T.J. Jaworski, who uh, lost to Kolod. You might know that name. Yes, I do. Jerry Kolod, well. yeah. He lost to Kerry in the U.S. Open. And then in Dallas at the Olympic trials this year, he, uh, he finished first and lost to Kolod in the finals at the U.S. Open. He tore his ACL, but he was a three-time national champion at Carolina. I and saw it, Rick. Was, I was there. I went down and volunteered my services at the Olympic trials here in in, in Dallas when they were oh, here. You're kidding. I, well, I actually my dad passed away that weekend, or I'd have been right there. I, we would have seen each other. Oh, well, what, what you Red, Red, so are you are you from Minnesota? Familiar as far as like uh, Shelton Benjamin and Brock Lesnar because they just they're just starting in pro wrestling. Yes, I'm familiar with those guys, of course. Yeah. 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 Any thoughts on the two of them? I beg your pardon. Do you have any thoughts on the two of them? Well, uh, I know Locke Bresner, uh, God, he's, uh, he's, he's a dynamic guy, uh, not only, uh, wrestling wise, but personally. I mean, he's a nice man. So I've been looking forward. I, uh, I hope for good things for him. Hey, Red, you ought to see him do a shooting star press off the top rope. Oh, oh God. <laughs> yeah. Oh. That's, he's serious about that one. Yeah, it's 290. It's 290. I'm a flyer. I'm telling you. Uh, These guys uh, are doing down. things now that I wouldn't even I wouldn't even know I don't even know the names of them. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great deal of respect for these guys that are working today. Seen. I want to tell you guys that because first of all, you know, they think that we're from a different era, and well, we are. But uh, I certainly respect these guys because these guys are making uh, life-threatening moves. Uh, every time I look at TV and I see these guys doing something and. They're high risk takers, you know, and their careers are, are shorter than ours was. Uh, I wrestled for 33 years, and uh, I'm still in fairly good shape uh, considering, you know. But uh, these guys, some of these guys are not going to be able to work very long because they're doing such threatening moves, my goodness. Red, Red I have I have the same respect and same same thought pattern you do, but I'm a little different. I want to see him beat Briscoe or Hodge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I don't even want to shake hands with Hodge. <laughs> I, I take my, my little boy to all the, the, the tournaments in Oklahoma. And Danny, of course, is always one of the guest um, guest officials. And uh, all these you know, these wrestling coaches, high school coaches from North Carolina, that in the last couple of years, they've never, they've never heard of Danny Hodge, which is almost appalling anyway. And I always do that thing. <laughs> Danny will grab him by the elbow, you know how he does, and grab their hand and say hi, and about break them in two. But uh, guys, those were, I, I, I just love the memory those memories of those great guys like that. God, I want to ask all you guys because um, you know Red and Les. I mean, um, Larry and Les. We've actually never had Red on. The, this is the first time Red's ever been on our show. But Larry and Les have been on many times. Um, we have not talked to either of you, and it, it hasn't been that long time wise on the air. But it's an entirely different business. And what are you? What are you know, Larry? Of course, we've talked a little bit um, personally. But what are, what are your thoughts as far as um, you know the the, the business today? Go ahead, Les. <laughs> Cause I jump that on you. You're on, Les. <laughs> Red, I can hear Red laughing. He said, "Yeah, go ahead, Thatcher. Put your foot in your mouth." <laughs> you know, I tell you the truth. Um, I feel more comfortable with this situation than with what was proposed. Uh, you know, with a few that uh, fish off by. And Dave, I've told you this. You know, uh, you and I have talked off the air about this. Uh, you know, Eric. Uh, built Nitro and the NWO and the whole thing and, and took uh, WCW to its zenith. There's no two ways about that. But I always felt that some of his things were also uh, created. He was the architect for the big loss last year. And I just didn't feel that for whatever reason, you know, it was a gut feeling, obviously, because I, I had no, nothing to found it on, but that those guys were going to be able to pull this thing out of the, out of the barrel and, and make it competitive again. And I think with uh, Vince and, uh, you know, Shane, uh, well, you know, Vince – doesn't like to lose. He's he's proud of you know. He's kind of got more of the the old school uh, attitude that the four of us would have, and he takes pride in his product and, and pride in his craft. And I think in that respect, it's good for the industry. I, I think uh, they will create something competitive, and uh, it's they'll be able to approach it from an entirely different standpoint than we've ever been able to do before. It's an interesting point, uh, and lesson. One of the some of the people that have talked to me lately have actually been talking about the submission or shoot fighting stuff, and and Dave and I have talked about this too how in many ways that type of whatever competition 
is in, in some ways like wrestling was in the 70s where you could almost build to a big show. You could, the, the business part of it, though, man, some of these people are just, I'm talking to one guy and I keep explaining to him, you know, but if you, if you have a nut this big and you only take in this much money, who's going to make up the difference? They don't seem to understand that. So I'm a little discouraged on that point of view. And, and as, as far as Rick said, too, about uh, individual towns trying to come back. God knows I, I keep thinking that dream again about St. Louis and, and recognizing how still in this town they recognize all these great names and kind of want to, in some cases, turn their heads at, at what wrestling is today. And, and, Rick, you were on the shows that came to the TWA Dome, so you know. And I talked to Zane Bresloff before this, and maybe this is talking out of school because I kind of gave Zane the tip to who to talk to at the TWA Dome, then they kind of ignored me, which is fine. That's cool. That's the way the business goes. But nonetheless... I told Dave at the time, they're going to come in the first time, they're going to draw a hell of a house. They're going to come in the second time, they're going to draw half a house. And the third time, they're going to die. What happened, Rick? They died. They died. Cause they you know what was, you know was amazing when you, bring, when you bring that up? The first time, because the first time you guys went to the, Rick, you went to the TWA Dome. Yeah. Um, there's like 30,000 people in, a, in the worst possible weather. I mean, it would have drawn a lot more. I mean, it was they the worst. That, and, and you came in there and you talked about Sam Mushnick and Bruiser Brody. Mm -hmm. And the whole crowd reacted. And then you came back the, thir the third or fourth time. It was the one that drew really poorly, like 5,000 people at that big dome. And you talked about the same guys, and the crowd was quiet. And what it told me and it told everyone was all those people came out the first time, and they didn't get the product that they remembered. And, you know, by the time you guys had come back, you know, and this was, you know, during the as the promotion was going down, this your, your audience, the, the, the audience that was left was the younger fans, and it was really sad that, like, you know, when the, when the name Sam Mushnick was thrown around, and I think it was maybe in a, in a program you did with Russo, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't remember offhand, and it was kind of like, wow, you know, they, they didn't know the name so much. Yeah, well, guys, I, the problem is, that I, I wish I could just isolate this conversation around St. Louis. I've Unfortunately, guys, I've seen it, and I'm not saying by any means that, that Charlotte and Greensboro were St. Louis or Atlanta was St. Louis. But they were great towns, Rick. Uh, you know, I, I think the Crockett felt that Greensboro was St. Louis. I think a lot of people that wrestled down here that never went to St. Louis felt like Greensboro was because they held 16,000 people and it was sold out, you know, every, every other week or every third week. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is we did it. We, we shot ourselves in the foot in every market we went to because ultimately we had a lot of great names and some great players and some great talents, but we did not deliver the product. And, the, the the showbiz part of it you know, carried us for a long time, but uh, you know that we, that we just we got an attitude and we just didn't deliver. And it's you know we all know. I mean, that I'm talking to everybody that's in the business now. I'm talking to you guys, but you know you've got to deliver at some point in time on what you're trying to bring to the table. If you don't, then, then you fall short. And we just we just I don't know how we crossed our wires because we were in a position to really really stay you know predominantly on top for a long time. Or certainly compete, and we just—it's funny. Vince, Vince cut down the showbiz, and he started wrestling harder. And uh, you know, to me, I mean, I, I used to when I was up there in '91. I said that he and Pat Patterson. I started. We used to not jokingly kid around. I said, Pat, you know, Hogan's gone. You can't give him a five-minute match anymore. If Bret Hart's going to be your champion, or I'm going to be your champion, you got to wrestle 15, 20 minutes in these house shows. I mean, we—I laughed about it with Hogan. I've made, you know, we've all talked about it. But, I mean, it, you know, the business has got to change based around the talent that's available. And when you've got guys like Austin and Rock and that, I mean, I, I, tell, I tell my son this all the time. When those kids are out there for 15 minutes. They're working their ass off. They don't slow down. They're in shape, number one. And number two, even though it might not be the style that Red Bastien and Rick Flair wrestled or Les Thatcher, they're working their ass off and they're giving them a wrestling match. And some, some of them are damn good matches. But they're, and they're doing it for 20 and 30 minutes. And that's where Vince got smart. He started giving the fans all the showbiz and good wrestling. And Rick yeah, especially in the pay-per-views. And don't yeah. you think, Rick, that Tremendous. Yes. he also supported it? I mean, because Ross was able to call a match. I mean, when I called a match with you, I called it like I was calling the Cardinals versus the Cubs. And, and that's what Ross does, basically. I yeah, mean, you know, that's what Ross does. Nothing Ross different, but he's, he's we providing you. We those kind of matches. Yeah, and he's got the guys who can work, and he's trying to support what you're doing in the ring as opposed to going off to some other tangent. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a mix. Talking about the main event. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at some point in time, you just got to deliver. And we, we worked for a while, and I can't really pinpoint anything that was to turn it around, but we just stopped giving them what we promised them. And, I mean, and we and we could look at the two shows, and even though 
maybe at that point Steve Austin wasn't as big as Hulk Hogan. I mean, you could see that it wasn't because McMahon wasn't trying to get him there. I mean, a week after week after, but they had him out there for 15 minutes wrestling every night. I mean, in tough, hard matches where the guys weren't stopping to grab their breath. You know, they were they just kept rolling. And, and I, I mean, I watched this rock. I told Arn Anderson, Arn and I, I said, you watch. Everybody, everybody said when Austin went down, I said, this kid right here is going to carry the load. You watch. Arn said, nah, I never catch up to Austin. It was, it was just a friendly, you know, conversation because he hadn't seen the rock that much. I was sitting home. I was doing that lawsuit was, uh, when the company had me sitting home and I'm watching this kid every week and I'm thinking, and sure enough, man, he went to another level. But, God, they have him out there making four or five comebacks, <laughs> you know, against three guys in ten minutes. You gotta be in shape to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's going back to the Valentine thing. He made a guy fight and fight and fight, and that's what those day faces are doing. Vince has surrounded himself with a lot of guys that can bump around for the Bay faces, and the Bay faces are in shape to give them the bumps. And they're wrestling their butt off. I, I mean, it, there again, I'm not saying it's what Vern Gagne and Red Bastien would call a great wrestling match or Ray, or Ray Stevens, but to me it's a great wrestling match because they're doing well, it's a great, it's a, if, 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 the, if the people react to it like it's a great match and the guys are busting their ass, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's a different I mean, style. It, it's not Jack and Dory, but it, no. it's great, and it's, 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 who cares? You know, I, that's one thing I've learned. I can't compare myself in Steamboat, you know, to The Rock and Austin because that's a different time. In Ric Flair's mind, I want to think that Steamboat and I had a better match. But you know what? We never drew six million people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different, world, a different way to deliver the, the product at that time. You know, yeah. I, I, got, I got a question, Rick, as far as like, you know, I, I wouldn't say that this is the turning point. Those guys are due. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I wouldn't say that this was the turning point, but I remember when this happened um, a little over a year ago. We were, we were doing the show. It was uh, when, when Benoit Malenko and uh, Saturn and, uh, and Eddie Guerrero left. And I just thought, in hindsight, that was going to be a real big deal because it cut. It gave them a mid card and gave them, you know, Ben Wong goes out there on every pay per view and, and you get a great match. And it, even though it's, he's been in one or two main events, but, you know, but, but you always get that great match. And that was something, you know, with Malenko as well, that you take away from your product and all of a sudden you, did, you were, you were down two good matches. They were up two good matches and, and, uh, there was a certain balance of power when it came to the wrestling side of it that really shifted when those guys left. No, I wasn't there, dude. That's another time that I was off. Uh, I can't remember what the situation was then, but it was, uh, I wasn't there that night, but, you know, it, it was a huge loss. I mean, I don't care. They can say, you know, about size or weight or they're not going to be projected as, as being the, the main event guys. Those guys are four great workers. And when four great workers walk out the door, following Jericho, who'd already gone, that was made five. Uh, and, and I, and to me, Benoit wrestles as big as anybody does. I don't care. Whether he's 5'10 or 6'5, Ben Wall wrestles as big and tough as anybody. Ben Wall, Ben Wall is as stiff as Valentine. <laughs> <Trust me. laughs> oh, I can't too. He's got those little hands, man. He'll knock you, knocks your, knocks your shoulder off. <laughs> but he, um, I mean, on top of that, he's a great worker. And he just, to lose those kind of guys was just a huge, huge mistake. And it was something that could have been worked out had people, and that, this is one of the problems, that had people that know anything about wrestling, you know, been running a situation. I mean, there's, you just can't ask ten different people for an opinion. You've got to be able to make a decision sometimes, in this business especially. That's what Vince does. I, I, I assure you, we all know that Vince has people around him to help make decisions, but ultimately I would be very surprised if he doesn't close his eyes in a private moment and make important decisions based on what he thinks. Rick, and, and, and Rick, problem. and it's a key thing, even back 30 years ago to Sam Muchnick, in the end, yeah, Pat O'Connor may have done this or Harley may have done that. Yeah. In the end, there was a boss, and, and Dave and I have talked about this a lot privately, too, uh, going back to 89, because Jim Herter approached me back then about coming with them, coming with, with you guys. And I remember meeting with Herd and Jack Petrick, and I asked them, I said, what do you guys want out of this? I mean, do, do you want a TV show? Do you want a wrestling promotion? I mean, there, there's two different things here. They couldn't give me an answer, and I don't think that anybody that followed up in the next 12 years really had that answer, and pretty soon there was no boss. There was no philosophy no, about it, the promotion. Let me tell you guys, it was just it, loose. It, it, if my book ever gets published, I'm gonna, I, I mean, I've been there since the day we walked in the door with Jack Petrick, and uh, mm-hmm. I flew out. I, can, I remember I took Jack Petrick to meet Roddy. I mean, this, I'm, I can tell a lot of stories. It's not that it makes a difference, but <laughs> I took Jack to meet Roddy Piper. I was, I was trying to recruit Piper, who was kind of on the outs with Vince at that time. And mm-hmm. I mean, there was just 
the, they, the door was there, but it was it was again. And you've heard all heard the story with the Braves when they were run by the by the Turner people and Turner TV people for years floundered. When they hired Bobby Cox, they became a, a wrestling. I mean, a baseball team. Yeah. And that's what's happened. I mean, with the exception of Bill, who came in, you know, and Bill didn't understand that, you know, Bill was just not the, the, the diplomat they needed to be. It's Bill Watts you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, Bill knew a lot about wrestling, but Bill, you know, was the Bill Watts, and he wasn't used to, you know, Bill wanted to wear a Zubas and a sweatshirt and come in the office down there, and I, I knew that that wasn't going to happen in corporate America because I've been there. I mean, I mean, I think Bill is a wrestling guy, and I, I know for a fact he learned a lot about finishes from Eddie Graham. I think Red can... Agree with me on that. I can verify that. that. Good attitude, but yep. Bill was used to running something about one third, about one millionth of size, and having total control. And then Bill didn't want any. Bill didn't want any, any input, and it just had to be a happy medium. I mean, and you know, <clears throat> I mean, I can go on and on, but they just have never been able to get the North and the South Tower on the same page, whether it be you know from the management side to the marketing side to the wrestling side to the contract side it's always been off balance and and as a result it's something we never i think we all thought could happen but never thought it would and it, the reason it has is because ted turner personally is so far removed from the product now that you know ted has nothing to say about it i'm sure I, i've even heard twice now that if ted had known about it he would have tried to block it but he didn't even know about it but ted, ted didn't ted, 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 ted you know he want he's pretty much out of the loop too yeah totally i mean you know he, he's one of the reasons we've ever been you know when nitro when Eric went trying to get Nitro put on TNT, you know everybody blocked it except Ted said, "Hey, you know what? We'll give it a try." But he, Ted. Do you think Ted could have even there. saved it now if he'd wanted to, though? I don't know. I don't know. Could you? I, the problem was the with the AOL, and you know what? If, if the if the company didn't have such a bad money year, yeah, I think it would have been totally different. But it was, it was, you know, it's a combination of things. It's like AOL comes in with no emotional ties to wrestling, and no, you know, there are these businessmen who don't know. The wrestling peaks and valleys, you know, goes up and down, and also that it had been that the reason it lost so much money was because it was so horribly mismanaged. But it's not like it inherently has to lose that much money, and not that like you know one or two big stars in a hot run, you can actually turn it around. Uh, Sixty million is hard one to turn around, but you know what you know what I'm saying. It it, it was only two years away from being profitable in the other direction, and but they didn't understand those ups and downs, and they just saw this is a money losing thing. We don't want it, and and that that was the time. You know, you had your bad year at the same time of the merger. That was the story. Well, I t in my opinion, Dave, the truth had ever been known, and I'm sure it's been it's known now, but if the truth were ever known about the amount of money that went out those doors, the people that never, ever performed one minute. Not you know, one Rick, you know, there's one thing, and you know, you, you know most of those guys, and I know a lot of those guys, and I do have to say the one thing that used to bother me was there, there, there came a time there that the guys forgot what being a professional wrestler was. And I'm not saying all of them because there's, there's huge exceptions to what I'm saying, but I know, you know, where guys would, you know, think that going on the road was not a part of their job description. And that's, you know, and then they would start coming up with excuses not to go on the road because the top guys would get away with not going. So then the yeah. middle guys would go, well, if they can, I can't. And then they would complain, you know, I've got to go on the road three days this weekend. And I'm thinking, you're making a half a million dollars a year. you got to go on the road three days this weekend. That's... That's part of the job description. Yeah, but Dave, mm -hmm. the, the, I agree with you in that respect. But the problem is, and everybody should, knows this, that all stops, that buck stops at the management level. If the first guy, if the first guy doesn't show up, whenever it was, whatever day, if he gets fired, then that sends a message. If the first guy doesn't show up the first time, and the boss says, "Well, that's okay, it won't happen again." <laughs> I think Brian. the problem was you just had top guys doing it, and since it was in the middle of a wrestling war, you had people thinking, "Hey, if we fire this top guy, he'll just be on Vince's TV Monday." Exactly. And, but you, you can't know, think what that do we way. get out of that? You can't, can't think that way. way. We, we, it, it's just, it, it, and I'll tell you something else, Dean. We just let it get to the point where we thought we were so high and so untouchable. I mean, when I say we, because I was part of it too, that. You, they just they lost touch with reality. You know what I'm saying? We just lost touch with reality. McMahon, in turn, who was getting the crap beat out of him, and everybody knows how bad he did too. I mean, there were a lot of things going on in his life, personally and business-wise. He, he, but if you've been around him, you know how smart he is. <laughs> I just I could see what he was doing week after week after week, and I, and instead of focusing on making our product better, 
Well, I think we were just totally concerned all the time and trying to compete with his product. And I mean, that, you know, didn't make any sense. Yeah, the other thing is, th th then, then you had everyone trying to trying to play his game under his rules, and you you can never win that way. You can't be a copy of what's the original. Yeah, you can't. That's to go back I gotta say, we can all put up bleach our hair blonde and go woo, but we're not Ric Flair. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and not to make Sam a god here in St. Louis, but I mean, we knew in St. Louis that other towns ran differently than we did, and Sam didn't care. This is what we do. We believe in it. We do it the best way we can. And like Rick said, somewhere in there that got lost. Well, we got to, Vince did this, so we got to do that. No, just just do what you're doing, what you do best with the talent you got, and let's let's have a boss who can make that decision, go that direction, stay the course, and you'll find your audience. Yeah, I, I can remember Larry, and you'll like this, because I, I remember I probably asked Larry, the first night I ever was with Dick the Bruiser, I didn't even know Dick the Bruiser. <laughs> he didn't know you either, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> but you sure took care of him. Everybody was there, and they kept saying, where's the Bruiser? And Larry, I think Larry, or I think, I think it was Larry, said to me, oh, he'll probably be here about 10 minutes for the match. Yeah. But, but he was Dick DeBruiser. That was acceptable. I mean, he was such a... He was such a, a commodity, not only them, but he'd been such a big star throughout the years that, you know, Sam Sam allowed him to do what he wanted to do, and he didn't, he didn't want to hang around the young guy. He came walking in, ten minutes for the match, put his shoes on, and went, yeah, I'll do it. You know, he just on the door he went. But you know, that was Dick the Bruiser. But that yes. was the exception because the guy was a superb, I mean, it, I mean, a huge draw number one, and at that point, a, a, just a huge card in St. Louis. And he and never he failed to deliver when it came motion. time. So. But, you know, Rick, what you're saying about, you know, what just happened with WCW over the last few years, and I think Larry and Red would concur. It's been happening for 11, 11 years. Uh, it's just been happening since 1989, the problem is. Yeah. It's, so it's what I was going to say is we've all seen it happen. We've All, all four of us have been involved, uh, major or minor ways with booking, and I think, you, you you know, when you get to the top and uh, sometimes the booker thinks, uh, you know, of course, it's always can you top this, and obviously at some point you cannot. But I think sometimes the booker gets thinks he's on such a roll that he can't make a mistake, and I think we've all seen territories. Oh yeah, you know, do a, a complete turnaround on that note. Yeah, well, I want to get I want to get to we, we only have one free line because of uh, because we're we have everyone up here, but I want to get to what Travis has been holding for a long, long time. What's been going on? Hey, how you doing, Dave? Doing really good. Yeah, um, I want to talk about Triple H today. Um, Okay. Well, do you think Triple H is going to start beefing with Austin anytime soon and go for the World Tech World Belt? Uh, at some point, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I was, um, the timetable. You know, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows the timetable exactly. Although I think it would make sense for SummerSlam. Yeah. And um, what's going on with Shawn Michaels? Nothing. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> you don't think he's going to come back anytime soon? Uh, you know, he had his chance, and um, you know, he he had his chance, and he didn't show up in shape, and. They don't even, you know, I mean, I, I talk to people there all the time. I mean, the name Shawn Michaels, it comes up on this show. It never comes up in my conversations with anyone there. It's yeah. almost like he came, I mean, we, we talked about it a lot before he got there. Then after that thing happened, it's like no one brings it up. I mean, they may, you know, I mean, Shawn Michaels, there'll come a day where he'll be brought back and they'll give him another chance just because of who he is, but uh, it may not be that soon. It'll be a while. Yeah, I yeah. heard um, that Shawn Michaels and Triple H aren't friends anymore or something like that. Th that I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it's business. They're they're, they're friends when they need to be friends, and um, you know, I mean, they're not. You know, I'm sure they like pick up for them or something and go. Well, you know, you know they were going to work a program, or or maybe or not necessarily a program, but they were going to work a match, and you know, it took the match away, and so they had to change some things. So I'm sure that's going to lead to frustration. I mean, Triple H is the reason he lost clean at WrestleMania was because you know the Shawn Michaels finish he was supposed to, that was supposed to be involved with got canceled because Shawn wasn't re you know they felt that Shawn disrespected their company by showing up. The way he did when he when he came in right before WrestleMania. Yeah. Well, all right. Thanks, Dave. Okay, you're very welcome. All right, bye. You know, one thing, Larry, I, I wanted to bring up because Brick brought up a little bit earlier. Um, there in, in St. Louis, this is so this is so weird to say, and no one will really understand what we're talking about unless they grew up in that era. But you know, you had like what whatever it was. Well, I remember when Sam died, we talked about this. There was like you know three no shows in the history of like 30 years of main events, as ridiculous as this sounds, and yeah. one of them was. One of them was Johnny and uh, Johnny Valentine. And could you tell a little bit about, I mean, it's like a no-show in the main event people wouldn't blink their eyes at, but what was the reaction like in the office, oh. you know, when you found out, I guess it was like probably a day or two before the big found card he was in the main Thursday event? Night, found out the night of his March 16th, 1973. I looked it up, so don't think it's my memory. I did look it up because I figured it'd probably come up. March 16th, 1963, Valentine was, Johnny was supposed to work with Terry Funk for the Missouri title. Uh, they had a hot thing on TV. 
And uh, the night before, Sam called like about 11 o'clock at night, and I guess Johnny had just been hospitalized in Houston, I guess, when he first had the heart problems. And, I mean, we we went into panic. I mean, uh, Sam got a hold of Gene Kaniski, I guess, by about midnight. Gene was on a flight like at 1 a.m. out of Blaine, Washington, to here. I was calling, literally, I called 20 radio stations that night. I was on the air, like, constantly from midnight till 3 a.m., talking about this thing. Then we start all over again at 8 o'clock in the morning. We had signs up everywhere. We had, it was in the Post-Dispatch. It was in the Globe Democrat. We still sold it, sold out, and they bought it because one time in, you know, one probably that that's really the only time when I worked for Sam that we ever had a change of main event. So that's one time in 20 years that we had a change of main event. But, but, yeah, but the thing, I, 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 I want to bring that up, that what you did, and the fact is, is that, you know, anyone in that town, anyone in that city knew that you played fair with them, that yeah. you were in hiding from them. It wasn't one of those things where you come to the building and all of a sudden, you know, I'm not going to mention names, but you say, you know, three or four of the top guys aren't there. There's no explanation given to the city. You, you know what I mean? In, in the ring, um, there's no suitable replacement. The matches just get canceled. Yeah, and that we, was, and that's what what ended up happening in, at the end with WCW. And that's exactly true. Yeah, because I went in the ring that night. We offered refunds. We may have done. I, I don't remember the exact number. We may have refunded six tickets or something. I mean, and then the amazing thing of that all was, and you talk about also the dedication of the talent from that era, be it a Johnny Valentine or a Gene Kaniski or whomever, by the time I got to the office the next morning, which was around 9 a.m., Kaniski was sitting in the office waiting for me. And he hadn't left Lane Washington at like midnight, 1 a.m. his time. So <laughs> you figure that one out. I mean, we didn't have to worry about the main event because Gene was there. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it was just a different reaction to to the product here in town. I mean, yeah, if we had a substitution, and Rick and Red, too, I'm sure before I was ever involved with Sam, Red Bastine can remember these days, and Les can, too, because he was at wrestling at the chase. If there ever had to be a substitution, Sam would have had a conniption fit. Yes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, and, you know, oh. ask Red and uh, Rick uh, in their careers how many shows they never made other than because of a serious injury, and I bet you they'll tell you they made every damn one of them. Probably with some serious injuries. Yeah, yeah. always. Everybody worked. Oh, yeah, exactly. you, well, yeah, the, we all the reason was through. is because if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. <laughs> well, that's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, that's, that's a good question. And I throw it out to Rick because he was there. Did the guarantee contracts hurt? Well, I have to tell you, honestly, guys, I think that, that I, I'm really in favor of the guaranteed contracts. You know, when I was fortunate enough and then fortunate enough to be part of that. But you see, the guaranteed contracts are really. One of the problems, and I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't even bring this up, but it was such an issue in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. Is we're the only com- the only athletes in the world, and I, I will always refer to us as athletes that don't have <laughs> that don't have the health insurance. We don't have a retirement or a pension plan. We don't have we don't have any of the the union benefits. Not that the union is the word, but we don't have anything like that in place, and that's. That's one of the reasons I tell people all the time that this is the most insensitive business in the world. I mean, five or six guys have died in the last three years, and you know what? You, they play their name on TV on Monday or Wednesday, the next week they're forgotten. And that's that's just the, how this business is. True. And, you know, when you talk about it, the kid asked about friends and that, I mean, you, you're lucky if you have four or five acquaintances, period. And if you have a couple friends, it's really a miraculous deal because everybody wants to be the man. And and there's no way that you know I mean it, of course with the money that's available now a lot more guys come out you know in better in better shape financially at the end of their career but it's an incentive of business and, and the now we're losing Rick uh, we okay well, the battery well, yeah I think his cell phone his cell phone ran out. Okay. No, thing, uh, 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 Dave, Dave let, me inter- let me interrupt here just for a minute. Uh, okay, you're going to lose ahead. me too. You're going to lose me too because I got some things I have to do here. So, okay, um, Red, I want to thank you so much, Red, for joining the show. Yeah, yeah so let, let, me, to you. let me just mention one thing before I go, and it's pertaining again to the Cauliflower Alley Club. And, but uh, you know, we're going to honor a young man this uh, this uh, coming February in Las Vegas, and he's a national champion, and he has no feet. And oh my God! I just I just wrote about him. La- I wrote a story about him last night. Nick Ackerman, right? Nick Ack. Nick. Uh, yeah, he won the Division Three Nationals with with, and he was with no feet. It's the most unbelievable story I think I've almost ever read in wrestling. It's it's a phenomenal thing, and we're going to honor him. But uh, I'd just like to read the last paragraph. Uh, there was an article in the USA Today on March the 29th, 
and he was being interviewed, and a reporter asked him about being disabled. This is his response. Don't call me disabled. He was asked what he'd prefer. He says, oh, well, I don't know. Call me national champ if you want. <laughs> <laughs> what a retort. I thought it was great. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to excuse myself, gentlemen. It's been nice talking to you guys again. It makes me feel good to think that someone remembered me all for a yeah, change. You're, you're a great tribute to the business, my you friend. You're a class act. All right, guys. Take care. Okay, thanks a bunch, Fred. we still got Les Thatcher and Larry Madison. Hopefully we can get Ric Flair back on. I'm going to hey, run Dave, one, the... one quick thing on back what, what Rick was talking about, and Les can, would probably understand a lot of this stuff, too. Uh, he, Rick was right about this being an incredibly insensitive business. And maybe I guess what I was referring to is more how people abuse those contracts as opposed to that if there was a need to do something if guys were hurt or if guys, they had to have something, didn't they, Les? I mean, there had to be a, a middle a, ground in there there's, somewhere. There's a happy medium. You know, you know one of the things, yeah. and, and, you know, I don't know that the, it's, I, I blame it on the management and not the contracts. You know, a lot of people, because Vince did one thing and WCW did another thing and Vince was more successful, therefore Vince's way is the only way. And that's not necessarily the case. And a couple of examples is that in the 80s, Crockett was the first one to do guaranteed contracts because he had to to keep his talent from going to Vince. And Vince, Vince was paying them basically, uh, you know, no one had a guarantee except for maybe Hogan in the 80s in the WWF, although they made, they, they made a lot of money because they had the opportunities working in house shows and everything. The Crockett wrestlers in that era worked much harder than the McMahon wrestlers just because that was what the fans demanded and that's what the promotion demanded. Now, what happened, I think, with you know, with, with the WCW, and it, it, it was bad. I think it was bad management because you know, we can look at Japan. Those guys all get guaranteed contracts, and you don't see. I mean, those guys, if, you know, they break their finger. You know, they wrestle because it's just how they're. You know, they they're. You know, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I and I think I think another thing too is you got to look at the individual, yeah. because I I think I, there's guys for, uh, this era or our era it doesn't matter who you can give them a million dollars a minute and they're still going out there and bust their hump because simply they take pride in what they do. You know, and that, that's their mindset. Like, I mean, Austin's a perfect example. Austin can get by doing half of what he does. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, he's over. He's He'll terrific. always be over. He's stone cold. But, I mean, I remember every pay-per-view when you watch him, I mean, he may not always have a great match. He usually does. But even when he doesn't, it's not because of lack of effort. No, it's not. Yeah. Well, if you look at that whole top tier of guys in WWF currently. Yeah. Oh, oh you're right, all of them. Yeah, exactly. And they would have made you're it about the 70s. Work ethic. You know, you and I, I think that's, that's part of it, too, because, you know, we can talk about baseball or basketball. I mean, what's the average NBA player? Six million or something? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, and there are guys that are lackadaisical there, obviously, but there's also guys that go out there and kill themselves. There are okay. Johnny Valentines. There are Johnny Valentines who go out there and they're going to perform, like yes. Les said, because they got pride and it matters to them. Well, you know, I, I think, uh, and, get, and back to why we're all we're on this this particular show to begin with, with Valentine, I, I, I mentioned that, you know, my first match with him, I was just a, you know, I'd only been in the business a couple of years and was still just, you know, strictly a, a, a job or a carpenter, as they call him then. <laughs> but, I mean, the point was, you know, we talked about how, how rough he was. Well, if you thought he was rough, if you didn't fight back, just think how rough he might have gotten. Mm -hmm. Or if you didn't get up off your dead butt and move, then you were going to get a, even a, a heavier dose. I mean, you got out there and worked with those guys, or you got out of the way, one of the two. I remember Dick Murdoch telling me once when uh, he started out in the business, he said, man, I spent like four or five months up in Kansas City. He said, and I worked with Geigel and O'Connor every night. He says, I had no skin on my back. He says, I learned I had to move. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had no skin left on my back because I was on it every night. <laughs> but, you know, everybody talks about those guys, uh, you know, being tough on you, and they were if, if you didn't respond. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, I remember working with Geigo as a young man, too, and mm -hmm. uh, some of those guys. And if you were out there busting your hump and they believed you were sincere, they would help you, Yeah. you know, and make you look good. I mean, I was surprised sometimes I'd work with guys of that caliber and I'd think, my God, I'm not this good. <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> but, I, mean, I was surprised. You know, I'm just running to take, take some calls, okay? All right, go ahead. Let's go. We'll go with Hector first. Hector, what's up? Hello. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I never got to see um, Johnny Valentine wrestle, but I want to know: Did Greg Valentine wrestle anything like his father? Similar style. Yeah. How would you compare the two, Larry? Yeah. You, know, you saw Greg and Johnny, and so did, yeah, actually, Les, you did too. As yeah. far as yeah, Greg was similar, just not as I would think. And of course, Les was in the ring with him, so he could speak better to this to this than I could. Johnny was 
as tough as they come. Greg was tough, but Johnny was in a kind of a separate league. He was up there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, Johnny Johnny was in a class all by himself. I mean, Greg was I think a good so, kid, though. you know, even Fez, if you read Hooker, mentions how tough and resilient Johnny Valentine was. Hey, and don't forget, April 24th, this is Luthez's birthday today. Is that right? Yep. This oh, is my birthday. Goodness. Great. <laughs> wow, so it'd be 86? Six. No, wow. uh, 85. 85. 85. Dave, oh, wow. Um, one time you mentioned um, a story about Greg Valentine and, and his father that um, something about the name, uh, I don't remember what it was, that they didn't want to be associated because Johnny Valentine. <laughs> Larry, knows, Larry knows this one because Larry was in the middle of it when they brought Greg in as Johnny's son, and Johnny got upset. <laughs> when he first came in at 71, we, we, the first program we billed Greg as Johnny's son, and the next day Sam called me in and he's almost almost apologetic he says well we're right he says but you know johnny's put a lot of time in this business and he's really sensitive to this and and we're going to call him johnny's brother so for about a year and a half johnny and greg were brothers here in fact they won a battle royal together once where in theory it was the valentine brothers won the battle royal here in st louis then sometime around after johnny had the heart attack he kind of acknowledged greg. of course greg was out of st louis he wrestled here when he first started out like 71 72 then he wasn't back again until 80 81 by then you know johnny was out of the business yeah, Les, um, yes. could there be a possible memorial show for Valentine? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I we'll certainly, you know, we're, we're doing a Pillman show in, in in August this year. We certainly will acknowledge Johnny. There's no two ways about that. I think what Rick, what Rick Flair said earlier on the show is we all have to realize we need to respect this man, and, and it's true. He, he was quite a pioneer and quite a stand-up guy in this industry. All right. Let's, let's, go, let's go to Carlo. Carlo, you're up next. Hello, Carlo. Carlo, yep. Yeah, how you doing? Doing really good. Um, I didn't get a chance to um, it was kind of before my time, Johnny Valentine, but um, um, I, I was just wondering, do you, what do you think he would be today if he was wrestling? It's a totally different world, and it's a totally different style. I mean, his style is is absolutely not what these guys do. <laughs> I mean. I, I mean, you know, would he have adapted? Um, I mean, he was a big guy. He looked good. Um, you know, and this was, and it's, it's, you know, it's a different kind of era anyway. But, you know, he had a physical presence that would have carried over. I mean, I was, as a kid, you know, Johnny Valentine was, um, I mean, he was one of those guys that you saw on the cover of a magazine or you saw in an arena and he had a certain look. He looked like a star. I mean, I was a little kid watching Johnny Valentine in Florida and he had an aura that, um, you know, I mean, I would say more than even Dusty Rhodes, more than anyone in that territory at the time, except for maybe Jack Briscoe, and only because Jack Briscoe had this certain thing where he, when you watch Jack Briscoe, you just knew that he was an, an athlete above the level of everybody else. Johnny was, so so that aspect of it he had, I mean, as far as the ring style, I mean, holding a guy in a hold for 15 minutes, that, that wouldn't fly today, but, um, you, could you know, see in I mean. Johnny's eyes, how serious he was, you knew he was serious. And yeah. I think every fan knew that. Anybody who saw him going down the aisle and may have been thinking, hey, I'm going to go up and take a pop at that guy. When they got close, they looked at him and said, nah, I don't think I am going to take a pop at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if we talk about, like, the physicalness and everything, I mean, you, you know, it's Chris Benoit, yeah, I mean, five inches taller. I think physically he could have done it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's not to say he wouldn't have been, you know, a bigger star and made tons more money now. I don't, you, you don't really know. I mean, every, everything in wrestling, and one thing I've learned is it's all timing being in the right place at the right time, I mean, and, and, and having the you light know. shine on you. With, it's, it's, it's so much of it's luck, a lot of it's skill, but a lot of it's luck. Um, I remember reading on the Internet that um, uh, you know, Greg Valentine and Ric Flair were uh, a tag team, that they used a move similar to a demolition or the Midnight Express, and the guy said they had they invented that move. Is that true? I, I don't know. I, ask, I, you know I was Rick's there. Not, Rick's not what here. were we talking about? Is it like a, one guy holds the other guy and the other guy says, and he drop off the top? Yeah, unless you were around uh, announcing yeah, it or right. just know, around they, it. They may have done that, but it I doesn't jump out at me that, that they invented it or that that was something that, you know, that just that started there. Um, gosh, I, you know, I, I'd be hard-pressed to tell you. There was, you know, that was, Rick's talking about good times in our lives. My God, that was one of the best, I think. There was so much good talent in that territory. And if you, you know, I mean, if you couldn't learn in that environment, you would never learn. That was, uh, but they were, they were a good team together. I remember... Greg trying to uh, match Rick on the mic uh, and trying yeah, to you know, talk loud and everything. And I know he, <laughs> remember he and I talking, and, and I said, you know, just be Greg Valentine. The people have to shift gears and listen to you, uh, you know, because Rick is one style and you're another. And and that was one of the things that I, I enjoyed at most at that point because I was doing a lot of those interviews was watching these guys develop and grow as workers. 
uh, Flair, Steamboat, um, Greg. The you had an incredible young talent. Tony roster. Atlas was there at the time. Tiger Conway Jr., Steve Kern. Uh, a lot of young guys developed in that in that atmosphere. And, and like I say, there's no way not to. I mean, you had to be totally inept not to learn in that group of guys. I believe Johnny was 72 years old, and he was. Uh... An absolute legend in the business. I mean, I remember, you know, we talked about this before. When I was a kid, you know, it was, you know, right up there with, uh, you know, your your top ten names, or I guess, in the business. You know, Ric Flair mentioned them. You know, like with Bruno San Martino, you know, the Funks, Jack Briscoe, Johnny Valentine, uh, Kaniski probably was up there still. You know, Buddy um, Rogers. Buddy Rogers was a few years earlier. Yeah. But uh, you well, know, Buddy Rogers, of course. Well, Valentine and, and Rogers did work against each other a lot in the late fifties and early sixties. Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, they all turned St. Louis around when Sam kind of had a down period around 60, 61. Uh, he went to probably the first TV angle on wrestling at the chase. Might have been Valentine and Rogers. Uh, remember Bill Dromo? Sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, Bill Dromo was supposedly Johnny's uh, protege, and Rogers put him out with a figure four leg lock and kept it on and kept it on after the match, and Johnny came to the ring, which they'd never seen before in St. Louis. And uh, needless to say, I mean, they popped it. And, I don't know if Valentine did a good interview, and I was probably 11 or 12 years old watching this, but I know Boyd had a tremendous impact because when Valentine came down and he laid about three, he probably hit Rogers three times, but that crowd just exploded. You know, Valentine was an that, awesome that, figure. You know, something I don't think anybody's mentioned uh, about Johnny is his sense of humor. Of course, most of the oh, father is, a, you couldn't tell from the air. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, you, know, you know, I mean, I, I tell you, on the Johnny Valentine ribs, I mean, he was, he was a feared guy, though. I mean, it was almost like a dynamite kid thing. Where you know it's like, you know, there's it's, it's a there's a dark side there. Well, you met, you mentioned Roger. Now this is one that a couple of the old timers, I, I I don't remember recall who now told me, and this this happened here in, in this territory when Johnny and, and Buddy were both working for Al Half, the offices up in Reynoldsburg outside mm -hmm. of Columbus, and uh, what set what set this thing off was uh, Valentine had a new tailor made suit and was had worn it to the matches, was bragging about it. He was in the main event. Rogers like the semifinal or whatever the case was. Anyway, he was on before Johnny. So anyway, while Johnny's in the ring, Buddy sits down with a razor blade and uh, cuts most of the seams in the pants and the jacket <laughs> so that when Johnny comes out, gets his shower, starts to dress, his pants and his jacket start to come apart in his hands. So finally, I guess he figures out that it's Buddy. And, they, of course, Buddy obviously denies it. So... Uh, a month or whatever goes by, and Johnny picks his spot. So they're down here in Cincinnati, as the story is told to me anyway, at the old music hall. And the roles are reversed. Rogers is on last. Valentine's in the semifinal. So uh, I think Rogers, you know, anticipating something, had, had one of the boys take his clothes, put it in their bag or whatever, and, and keep the bag out of the dressing room or at least in their sights. Or, uh, Johnny couldn't get to it. Well, Johnny found, found another way to do it. Rogers gets dressed and, and goes out to get in his his uh, caddy to go back to Columbus, and uh, the caddy's up on concrete blocks, and the rims and the tires are gone. And Valentine's throwing these in the trunk and taking them to Columbus with him. So Rogers had to buy all new rims and tires for his Cadillac so he could go home. You know, there was a certain rapport between the guys, though, because, you know, if you saw those two guys in the ring, it was just an awesome match. Oh, yeah. Just an awesome match, but they respected each other enough to do those things and still do something just totally different when they were wrestling. I mean, it was just a different era. And I guess maybe today, and that's probably not fair, because I'm sure among the, among the top guys, there's, there's got to be tremendous respect between Austin and Rock. And oh, Triple I would H. think, yeah. And, and, you know, and they, now Rogers was my childhood idol. Mm -hmm. And I look back and think, my, I couldn't have hardly picked a better one right. in terms of psychology and, and the whole nine yards there. But, yeah, I agree with you, Larry. I think, I think there was a, 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 a hell of a mutual respect between the two. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go to the calls. Let's go to Jimmy. Jimmy, what's up? Hey. Hey, what's going on? Uh, uh, first time caller. Uh, man, y'all are really bringing up some memories. I grew up on the Mid Atlantic area in the seventies and eighties. Um, I remember a thing about. I'm sorry to hear about Johnny Valentine's passing. Um, I remember one time he had a match with Tim Woods. The story. And uh, he put the figure four on him, I believe, and he wouldn't let it go. And he ended up, the angle was he broke Woods' leg. And then Nasser sure. asked him, asked, Nasser asked him, well, why did you do that? He said, I went temporarily deaf. <laughs> 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 well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another thing. You know, Johnny would take six or eight, maybe even ten punches to get one in on you. I remember watching him. He just, 
he like y'all was talking, he just just hammered uh, hammered it home. I tell you another thing. Now I want to uh, talk to Les for a minute. Okay. All right, Les. Yes. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, special you had on MTV about wrestling last Thank year. You, sir. That was really good. Your your segments were were the highlight of. I like to deal with the kids. <laughs> did you do like when he told that guy off? Yes, I loved it. It was. We great. all did. <laughs> He was going around telling everybody he was a wrestler. He said, "I got to tell you, you're not a wrestler." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he thought he was cool. I tell you, like, just to, I tell you, go back a little ways with Les. Les, I remember you doing a show. I don't know if it was Crockett doing, but I believe it was called Southern Wrestling in the early '80s. Uh, that would have been well. That that was well. In part, it was because uh, that was when Ric Flair, mm -hmm. Blackjack Mulligan, right. and Crockett Jr. bought. Uh, the Knoxville territory right. from Jim Barnett, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, I was through. I'd, I'd been in Pensacola actually mm -hmm. with Ron Fuller in Southeastern, right. and they had uh, called me and asked me to come back and, and uh, mm -hmm. produce their TV. So yeah, that that was what was called Southern Wrestling at that time. Yeah, that was before Barry Windham was Barry Windham. He was Black Jack Mulligan Jr. then, and and, and a, a reed thin young man, exactly. Yeah, he was, and I tell you, I really enjoyed you on uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling too. Thank you, sir. That was just, uh, I, I think if that company had had the backing that it needed, that could have been a, I don't know, it could have been a major force in wrestling. Well, I was you had... somebody today, you know, we started calling WWF at one point Smokey North. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the best talent was up there. Well, I tell you, Les, how did you like working for the Crockett's? I enjoyed it. Uh, I really did. Uh, Jim Crockett Sr. Mm -hmm. was a class gentleman. I mean, the right. whole, I, I mean, I had no problem with the whole family. Right. I worked, of course. The kids, uh, Jimmy Jr. and I were about the same age, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, Jackie and I uh, socialized a little bit together, but right. uh, worked with the, the sister as well in the office doing the magazine mm -hmm. in the 70s. But Mr. Crockett Sr., mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a good uh, a good businessman, right. he took care of his talent. Now, we were talking about insurance and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I came down with hepatitis in 72 right. in that territory, mm -hmm. and um, he would call me at least twice a week. Mm -hmm. And say, hey, baby, uh, everything okay? Yes, Jim. How's, what's the doctor say? Well, I, I'm trying. No, no, take your time. Don't be in a rush. Get back. Uh, how are things? Car payment made? Yes, sir. Everything's fine. Um, and he would send uh, either Klondike Bill mm -hmm. or Big Boy Brown, who lived around right. me, uh, in with a check every week. Mm -hmm. And then he'd call afterwards. And he got, I, uh, he'd say, well, how's it? I said, no, I got the check, Jim. No, no. He said, that's just for incidentals. Right. If you need something, you call me. Man, that's class act. Yeah, and the other thing was he always closed down, depending on what day Christmas uh, fell on. He right. always closed down usually a week, at least mm -hmm. a week before Christmas, because he would tell you. He said, "I know most of my people are employed by me are mm -hmm. from out of state and from out of town, right. and I want you all to go home, you know, have Christmas with your families, and, and come back and we'll go again." Man, I didn't know that. That was really nice. Of yeah, me. he was a good gentleman. I tell you, I tell you, how did you like working with Rip Hawk? Did you ever work with him? Oh, sure. Rip was good. Well, Rip. Uh, Gave uh, Rick Flair a good education. Oh that yeah, I used to. Remember I used that? to love to watch Rip. I liked the the the, the heels because they were so. Yeah. They gave him better interviews and yeah, everything. Rip, yeah, Rip was a good a good heel interview, very good. And then well, he used to always say, "Get the profile, get the profile." <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> All right, y'all have a good one, then. Thanks. Bye. Okay, thanks a bunch. Les, MTV's doing like a follow up on that uh, that uh, previous special, right? Yeah, they're supposed to. They haven't gotten uh, back to me. They didn't. Uh, they haven't set a date for production yet. But yeah, they're they're planning on doing one. So yeah, it'd be like catching up on like Rory Fox and things. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, Les, that guy could be the hottest the show chase. in this business, at least on a short short run, right? <laughs> Les, didn't you work wrestling at the Chase? Weren't you in the Coruscant room in the, early in your career? The what? The Coruscant room, the Chase Hotel in, in St. Louis, the early in your career. Yeah. You, I, I want to somehow it sticks in my head that you came in with Dennis Hall. Right. Okay, was Roger Kirby in that bunch too? Yeah. Okay, I kind of remember that. And when you, when the gentleman mentioned Rip Hawk, of course, Hawk, when when wrestling at the Chase came back, came into St. Louis when television came back in 1959. Hawk may have been the the first TV star of 1959-1960 in St. Louis. You know what I remember, really? Larry? Uh, one of the uh, why it jumps out of my mind, I don't know exactly, but uh, but Bobby Bruns was the booker the first yep. time I worked there. Yeah, Bobby was there. And uh, I remember this because I remember not to make a mistake. Uh, Bobby, we're talking about old old school guys here. I, I remember hearing Bobby lay finish out to this guy, and he said, "Now you throw two drop kicks, and then he's going to sidestep you on the third one, and he's going to kick your, you know, tap your feet. I need you to land. Uh, I don't know what he said, like you know, just a foot from the ropes, 
and, and a, uh, parallel to the ropes, the blind is playing a finish out. And the kid threw t- uh, one drop kick and went to miss the second one and landed farther than a foot from parallel from the ropes <laughs> and got his butt chewed out. <laughs> Bruns apparently was a pretty good performer in his day, too. Now, I think he went to right about 69, Pat O'Connor came in as a booker, and that's about the time I started working for Sam when I was in college. Right. And Bruns went to Buffalo with Pedro Martinez, I think. Uh, I'll tell you who who was carrying jackets around St. Louis. It was uh, Bobby Shane. Bobby Shane I knew real well. Very good friend of mine. And his dad was refereeing. Yep. Yeah, Bobby. I didn't know. I didn't know that Bobby Shane's father was Joe Schoenberger. Yeah. Well, no, Joe's not a father. Joe's not a father. The father was Lee, but Joe was some sort of relation. Yeah. Well, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? Uncle or something? Something like that. Yeah. But Bobby. That's right. Yeah. Bobby was the second. That's how he started out. And the Joe Millich was probably beating him up down at the YMCA every day. Yeah. I remember him telling me about Joe. I remember Joe Millich, but I remember Bobby telling me about working out with him. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's funny. Um, uh, Bobby Heenan carried my jacket when he was a ring boy <laughs> in Indianapolis, and Bobby Shane is sick. <laughs> Good grief. Now, Bobby Shane, if he hadn't been killed in a plane crash, I wonder, uh, Bobby Bobby was a, was a hustler. Yes. Yeah. He was a great uh, uh, heel with great psychology. Of course, he grew up in the St. Louis thing, seeing all that psychology. Even though Bobby was not big, he would be a, a small guy, I guess, as they would say, as a, about a Benoit type, different style, obviously. Right. But Bobby well, was well, smart. During the uh, During the promotional war in Atlanta, uh, the NWA Gunkle thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bobby and Bill Watts were w- one of our top heel teams. That's right. And their uh, chemistry was just so edgy. I mean, there was never any plan to turn one against the other and switch one babyface. But they, uh, it was always there. You know, Bobby would sit on the edge of the desk and blow cigar smoke at Bill's face, and Bill would chat, and he'd call him Willie, and Bill would chat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was great stuff. Gordon and I just sit there and, you know, I mean, it was stuff they played off the top of their head. It wasn't, you know, that they'd sat in the back and worked it out. Bobby had a great mind for it. He would have yeah. been a terrific booker, I think. You know, Larry, what, what uh, the, the ironic thing of that whole, uh, of him dying that plane crash, mm-hmm. was the two things. Bobby hated to fly yeah. in small crafts, and he was afraid of water. I didn't realize about the water. I knew he hated to fly. Yeah. Wow. I want to, I, I, we've got to wrap this thing up, unfortunately. Um, I want to thank both of you guys for coming in on short notice, and, um, uh, I wish it was under better circumstances. Obviously, tomorrow on this show we're going to be from San- we're going to be at Santa Ana, California. There's going to be a UPW show, and uh, Asian Christian are going to be there. Tommy Dreamer are going to be there. We're going to have a lot of the guys from that show, including Prototype, Mike Modest, on the on the air. As well. I'm not sure who else we'll have on the air, but uh, we'll have a full lineup of people, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow at five.